Um, so, Bruce and Joyce, thank you so much for uh, joining the IUR department today to talk about um, root cause analysis and how you're applying this to your product quality problems uh, in winemaking. Um, so, Bruce uh, graduated from UC Berkeley in 1979 with a BS in engineering physics. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Joyce, are now home grape growers and winemakers, and they just published a book called A Quest for Quality Wine Every Time, A Guide to Root Cause Analysis. Um, so yeah, go ahead and take it away, Bruce and Joyce, and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So today we're gonna, uh, as Keith mentioned, we're gonna talk about uh, solving uh, quality problems with various methods that we've used over the years in aerospace, applying to uh, winemaking uh, uh, specifically and in general. So a little bit about us. I'm uh, retired from aerospace, worked about 35 years, uh, developed many ground, air, and space optical sensors and systems over the years. I've had a number of different roles, uh, research scientist, uh, engineer, program manager, and I've also taught uh, various courses. Uh, Joyce, you want to give us some background? And I'm also um, retired at a aerospace executive. I worked uh, my degrees in chemistry, so I started off in materials and processes in the labs and then moved to engineering and did a, a variety of roles over the years. Uh, I had the opportunity to take an early retirement, so uh, I was looking at our hobby of winemaking and thought I would kind of explore the, the, that industry, so I worked at a, for a crush at a vineyard, I worked in a tasting room, I worked in a home uh, beer and wine shop, and I installed a couple of vineyards to kind of see what, what uh, the whole gamut of, of opportunities were. We both did uh, go through UC Davis's winemaking certificate program. Uh, our vineyard is 14 years old, and we've been making wine for 12. Thank you. So um, one of the things that we encourage uh, people to think about uh, uh, when you encounter your problem and even, even better when you start uh, developing your product is what do you think about, how do you define quality? And kind of the general quality notion has a couple of sense, uh, senses. One, the intensity of a particular attribute or the characteristics or unique attributes that define it. So we're encouraging winemakers and other product developers to think about uh, quality and define that uh, quality in a way that you can work on the problem that's applicable to what uh, you're facing. And so you can, and also think about it in a couple of different ways. One, in the wine world, uh, what the, though the users, the wine drinkers, actually like and enjoy the sensory characteristics, which is somewhat subjective, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But also think about other attributes that you may want to associate with your, with your wine, whether it's a, uh, you want to sell an expensive wine or you want to have a higher volume of a less uh, expensive wine. It's important to think about these goals uh, when you attack your problem and even better when you start your quality development. So uh, what are the benefits of root cause analysis? Uh, and just backing up a step, in uh, the wine world, grape growing and farming, making wine has been around for thousands of years. And so one might think that, well, this is a, this is a solved, uh, solved problem and uh, recipes are prolific and people won't be really facing uh, many issues. But that, like many complex things, there's so many variables involved. Uh, many of these variables you'll understand, many of these variables you won't be able to control. And in the world of wine or grape growing, the weather is such a significant issue, the, the pests, where you're located and you're trying to grow grapes, and there's so many issues that may show up in the, in the winery. So, Part of the key uh, benefits that uh, RCA methods 
and rational methods offers. They help organize and prioritize tremendous amount of information. And, and that is it's so critical this day and age because you can almost look up anytime 24 seven on, on Google or other online sites, uh, questions and answers and get factoids of information. But you need to understand, it not, is it true? Is it, is it relevant to your situation? Is it the whole story? Are there aspects that you also need to know? So uh, root cause analysis and the techniques we'll talk about help organize and prioritize this information and they improve your chances of solving the problem that you're facing. And even in the cases where you're not able to fix it on this particular vintage, you can adopt or employ or look to preventive measures that will help improve it next time. So um, one of the things that, that the first technique we're going to talk about is um, cause and effect diagramming. And it kind of sorts out problems in six major categories. Either it's the processes that you're using or the materials you're using, the equipment you're using, the people doing the work, the measurements you're making, or the environment. And uh, and in many cases, it's multiple factors. So in this example is has to do with, you know, we, we our fermentation didn't finish and it's all about the yeast. Did the yeast um, convert the sugars to alcohol? So for the processes, it's, um, this is uh, some sort of all the methods. Um, so like the action of mixing the yeast to hydrate it um, and to add it to, uh, um, to start the fermentation, that's the process. The material is the actual yeast and the water you use to dilute it and the nutrients you use to feed it. Uh, equipment is machinery and devices that um, are used for the processes and the materials. In the, in the small case, it's, it's a container, so it's not much in the way of, material, of equipment, but in some cases, it's the equipment is the complex factor. People, who's performing this? Um, it's the laboratory staff or the production staff. Do they have the right training at our, and the attention to detail? Or is it somebody else did it this time? Or it's somebody uh, that didn't get adequate training? Measurement is um, really about measure, measurements being done correctly, understanding the uncertainty or the error. So weighing out this, the right amount of yeast, the temperature of the yeast and the hot water. Uh, because if it's too low, it doesn't, doesn't wake up. If it's too high, it'll die. Uh, so temperature is a big part of the environment. Environment might be humidity, might be cleanliness, um, sanita sanitation of, of things, et cetera. So all these categories help us sort out potential problems. Um, there, one technique we talk about is called the five whys. And it's basically asking the question why, why did this happen more than once? Because the first time you ask why, like, why this wine get over sulfited? Well, Joe did it. Okay, well, let's blame Joe. Uh, but really, did Joe make a mistake? Is he going on memory? Did he have a well-written procedure? Does the procedure tell him every step to do? Does, why do we need a procedure? Well, if different people are performing this task and you want it to happen the same way every time, you should have it written down and you should have clarity in that procedure. So the number of questions of wh why you ask why isn't that, doesn't have to be five, but it's probing deeper and deeper, peeling the onion to understand whether or not you really got the right answer. So one of the other early things we like to do is to def define, write down, think about your problem statement. This will become the effect that you're going to be working on to solve. And most problems uh, will have observable effects. There's a few that might be very subtle and not discernible, but most will have observable effects. And it's important to describe the problem uh, in as much early detail as, as reasonable that fits your, your plan. Describe 
what happened, when did it happen, when meaning in what, at least in the wine world, at what phase of the process, did it happen in the vineyard, did it happen in the, in the winery, who was involved, uh, et cetera. Uh, these kinds of things uh, provide layers that you can start early and get a good head start in your uh, investigation. For example, the, the first example on the top right, if we, if, uh, we discover just after harvest, because we are trying to test and taste as we go through all, all phases of our product development, uh, there's a problem. We want to make sure that we write down and document uh, what grape variety this is. Uh, it's Cab, Cab Sauv. What was the sugar level when we harvested? Also, what was the acid level? Uh, and when was that measurement taken? Is that test data that was actually from a week or two prior? Were there weather? What was the weather that was happening at the time that these measurements happened? Uh, and where in the vineyard? We're kind of getting into the if you really want the high-end quality product, we're doing what is often referred to as precision uh, farming. And what part of the vineyard uh, did these grapes or these samples come from? And how did we make that, that measurement? So it's important to think about um, early on and write down and document what are the observables of your problem. And we don't also want to caution, uh, not at this point, to do too much speculation we want to get the facts of the case written down and the observations uh, clear so we can move out from there. So um, Joyce mentioned the, uh, uh, the fishbone technique. And this is, this is somewhat of a generic but it, uh, fishbone, but it uses our uh, division of kind of, we're, we're thinking about the universe of problems <laughs> falls into these uh, six categories, process material equipment, or people measurement and environment. And the problem statement that we're defining is that effect. And so we're encouraging also at the beginning, uh, as Joyce mentioned, to think about all six categories so that when we're starting our investigation, and yes, some problems will have obvious flaws and maybe you can track them down quickly, but most are nuanced and subtle. So we want to consider all these possibilities and then quickly start narrowing it down. So here's a wine uh, example where we kind of populated the bones on the fish. Um, and it's really all about, as you start to assess a problem, is to think, understand kind of the, the science behind what causes, what, what can cause this problem, and then look for um, processes, materials, equipment, et cetera, that would be uh, the cause. All the, and you want to find all the potential causes. What we're trying to avoid is just tackling the most obvious or the most common problem. Because you got to wait a whole year before the next year's harvest so you know if, if what you fixed this year really was the cause of your problem, or do you get the, it's a problem returned. So, we're trying to find all of the potential problems and you have as open-minded as possible to do that. So now we'll go through all six of those major categories. The first one being processes. Um, in our book, we kind of broadly sort out the processes into these nine phases of uh, where starting with grape, grape growing, harvesting, destem and crush, ferment, et cetera. And within each one, there's lots of little procedures or processes that have a lot of detail. Um, but you start with these nine major process bones on the fish bone, and then the applicable ones you break down further to, to pinpoint where your problem cause is. Materials is the second bone. And these are the ingredients. These are... Um, in the case of winemaking, it's the grapes themselves. Any water you use um, to dilute uh, additions, the yeast material, the nutrients for the yeast. Uh, even we, we've, we sorted out bottles and corks, you know, they're really not a piece of equipment. They are, are in intimate contact and they stay with the wine. Um, so they are kind of a raw material. 
material in that sense. So um, another one of the categories, the equipment. And one of the key messages or a few of the key messages on this chart about equipment is it's important to understand how your equipment operates. How does it function? And try to understand that in detail or someone on your team understands that in detail. Secondly, how might that equipment fail? And thirdly, how might that equipment still be working, but it's actually partially failed or on its way to failing and it's operating in a degraded mode. So for example, in uh, the top row, we use uh, a destemmer crusher once we get the grapes harvested out of the, out of the field. And we also show just an illustration of a small hydraulic uh, press there. And um, the press, uh, one of the ways that um, a press uh, may impact quality and still be operating has to do with uh, the number of times that you run through the cycles or the pressure at which you're pressing at. So when you first fill this kind of hydraulic press uh, uh, with must and you're squeezing out the, uh, the juice, uh, the first uh, wine flows out uh, in a free run fashion and that has some the least bitterness associated with it. And then on the first press, you're kind of pressing more of the, the skins which don't make it through the filters. And those skins are one of the uh, sources of some of the bitterness and other compounds that impact the flavor of the wine. And there is a balance that we do want that in the, in the quality wines. And then if you go, if you're really pushing to get the highest volume uh, and you're going for a third press, you can actually overpress and there's almost nothing but skins left and you're really extracting some of the most uh, bitter compounds. And so it's important uh, to understand how the, the equipment uh, can possibly fail and how it should be properly used. And one more example, in the, in the middle row, uh, we use lots of different tanks for aging wine. You can see the oak barrels on the left or the plastic containers uh, in the next to them and then the stainless tanks and some glass carboys. Well, each has its own uh, way of functioning and the, the oak barrels give that wonderful oaky uh, vanilla flavor to, uh, that we enjoy uh, in some red wines, but they also, uh, they evaporate wine. And when you're aging um, a nice wine for a couple of years or 18 months in an oak barrel, you'll lose a lot to evaporation. And so one constantly needs to top it off to fill that headspace, other you can get some uh, degraded effects. Whereas the plastic tanks uh, are more of a fixed volume, but they don't uh, leak nearly as much. And then the stainless tanks really don't leak at all, except for in the case where the lids, in their variable lids, if the tank and the lid is used for a number of seasons and washed or mishandled, you can develop gaps or air leaks in those, in those lids and not realize that uh, your stainless tanks actually have some leak air through the lids that could be damaging, damaging the wine. So um, in all of these processes, uh, people are involved. And, and yes, uh, Mother Nature does so much for uh, growing and ripening the, uh, the proper grapes. But it's also the people, the vineyard manager and maintenance uh, crews that are part of the constant uh, uh, um, canopy management, uh, which means uh, pruning at the right time and at the right level to give the right sun exposure to your grapes and, and air flowing through so you don't get excess buildup of, uh, of mildew. Uh, uh, people are involved in all of the, all of the proper processes. Testing. Testing gives you very objective evidence, but it, it requires calibration and trained operators of that equipment. So even though they're using, doing the performing the titration test in this example, that uh, you get an accurate, uh, accurate measurement. So training your people, and as Joyce mentioned earlier, using people uh, with the right skills that are appropriate for the job, because even 
you know, in winemaking, there's a lot of routine um, repetitive task as there are in, in complex uh, product development, big manufacturing lines, a lot of repetitive tasks where repetition can be a distraction and you can inadvertently, uh, something can happen and get missed through the line and so all of a sudden you have some lower quality uh, products going through the line. So training, using the right skilled and trained people for the various jobs is an important part of this, of this aspect. And uh, measurement is the next bone. And this, you know, a lot of measurement errors really fall into the people category. If a person makes the measurement wrong or does the calculation wrong or records it incorrectly, then that's really a people problem. The measurement bone is more an instrument problem or calibration problem. So some common examples we put here are you know, the cheap thermometers aren't calibrated. So they're okay if you're just kind of getting a general idea, but if you have a critical measurement, like above this temperature, we're dead. <laughs> you got to use the right uh, high quality measurement device. pH is commonly measured and the standards, standard buffers for pH meter calibration are three and seven pH. But for wine, we have to buy the, I mean, sorry, it's normally four and seven. But for wine, we have to use the buffer that's 3.0 so that we're making, because that's where we're making most of the wine measurements. And you've got, you've got to calibrate the range of your measurements. Um, and of course, then there's techniques. You can't you try two different techniques and expect the numbers to match. Every technique has its own, um, uh, errors, um, me measurements that can be temperature sensitive, so you've got to adjust for that and even uh, make sure that sometimes you've got to treat a sample like degas it or allow the solids to settle before you take the measurement. And so all those things are important uh, factors. And then the last one is environment. And really the biggest one for winemaking is temperature. And it's temperature during the grape growing as well as during uh, fermentation. So the three yellow columns are the big, the long periods of time where the most things can go wrong. In a fermentation, if it gets too hot, you, you, you have fundamental problems. Aging goes for a long time and you've got to have a controlled environment for that. So take good measurements, control your environments. And if you have a problem, look to these areas as what could have gone wrong here. So once you've filled out your fishbone of all the, what we think are possible causes for our particular problem, and you've had been very open-minded, you've got everything down, now you've got to disposition each one of those potential problems. And here's where you've got to look at data look at e-records, notebooks, interview people, look for any patterns, any unique conditions, any anomalous uh, notes. It might be, oh, really, the two wines we have problem with both were in the same tank at different times, or um, whatever it might be, where you're looking for something that um, dig as deep as you can, and this objective evidence might can either say, this, I've, I can prove this is the likely problem or I have evidence that this is, can't be the problem and you can disposition it that way. And then of course you might, uh, there's the difference between corrective action and preventive action. When we have a bad wine and we can treat it or fix it, that's correcting that particular wine. You also need to take preventive action so it really doesn't happen again. And of course, what you're seeing is the more data you have, the better record keeping, um, the, the easier it is to find these uh, needles in the haystack. So another um, aspect of uh, measurements is, is measuring things that are important to your uh, product or the quality aspects of your product. And, in, and also measuring um, from the early phases to the middle to the end so that you have this quantifiable or, or objective data that will help you 
keep your on track uh, progress towards a quality end item product. And also when you're facing a problem, go back and with the timing of when it was first observed, start looking at characteristics of the data and records that you have. So for example, on the, the left hand slide, we take um, a lot of measurements of what's going on in the vineyard. And we even have a, we even have a, a weather station down in our vineyard and uh, um, we record soil moisture and temperature in that upper slide. The red line is over uh, a number of weeks and we can see at least in the winemaking business in, in this growing region and we're in a canyon in the Santa Cruz mountains, we still get good diurnal variation with uh, um, cold nights and relatively warm uh, hot days. And we like to have those measurements uh, throughout the growing season and tracking uh, the berry growth through its different phases. So we have that data and it can guide us on how do we adjust the canopy uh, pruning and such throughout the season or watering levels. Uh, and we like the, the chemistry measurements, as Joyce mentioned, to also give us quantitative data, uh, pH, uh, acid, acid types. Uh, we do a secondary fermentation, malolactic fermentation. So we like to look at the malic and lactic acid concentrations uh, as we progress through our winemaking processes. And I mentioned earlier about understanding, uh, defining your own meaning of quality and understanding your clients or your users uh, sense of what quality means to them. And it, yes, it is very subjective. Uh, people like wines that they, they like to drink or pair with certain foods, but you can take it a step farther and actually break that down. And we like to use the, uh, sometimes it's called the Davis 20 point scale or the Amarine scale where it breaks down uh, wine characteristics, our end item product into different layers, the, the appearances, the color, the aromas, the mouthfeel and taste, and, and you can assign scores. And we, we try to do that or recommend doing that uh, when you first get first wine out of, out of uh, press and through the uh, aging process and see how that progressed. And we keep those records so they can go back from earlier vintages and kind of compare uh, how things are, are changing and evolving. Um, this is another uh, technique that uh, we want to thank uh, Dr. Sawhill for uh, the naming of this technique. And this is called the Bow Wow Method. It's the best of the best and worst of the worst. And essentially in, in, in wine and other uh, complex product developments, there's many variables that over the course of the development process that could influence uh, the end item uh, product quality. And so this technique looks at the, uh, the best of the best wine that's produced is also compared against the worst of the worst. And yes, this works well with large sample sets, but even if you have a few, uh, just a few uh, end item uh, systems, you may have multiple subsystems or components or materials that go into that. And so what we're trying to do here is kind of pull out the best of the best wine, a certain vintage and compare it, for example, with another vintage that in theory uh, at the top level use similar processes, but one is, is high quality and one is not. And then we look at those those uh, six areas beneath uh, the uh, processes, was best practice used in those different processes, the materials involved. And this illustration is just a simple cartoon that, that indicates, well, we noticed a pattern or a high contrast of the best quality wine, both happened to be Cab Sauv, uh, but one was much better quality than the other and we noticed that uh, the highest quality came from vineyard two and the lowest quality from vineyard one. And there was a lot of other wines uh, somewhere in between, uh, but this technique allows us for, at least at the start of the investigation, we're gonna not look at those, we're gonna sort out, filter, 
and narrow in uh, on the best of the best and the worst of the worst quality and go after the vineyard sources of those two different, different wines. Uh, this technique is called the uh, Kepner Trago uh, method, and this was uh, we used quite a bit in uh, aerospace, and it helps one uh, make important decisions in a way that's consistent with what you and your your team considers as important. So the matrix on the right is commonly referred to as a KTA Kepner Trago analysis uh, matrix and it essentially this particular example has four major rows underneath the uh, headers quality schedule cost and risk and then it also has three major groups or columns that have to do with three options that we that we have to solve our our problem so this this technique is used in the in the phase where you've done the uh, investigation and you've narrowed down a handful or a small number of uh, uh, corrective actions or preventive measures, in this case, three different options. And so um, these options happen to be, uh, in this simple example, we have a color issue with a wine. We were making a red and we wanted a nice dark uh, garnet, uh, deep colored red, and it turned out very light, almost like, like a rosé and so we, we look at in, uh, what options do we have to fix this uh, next time around. We're not going to be able in this case to fix the current vintage but we can do a better job next time. So our three options here happen to be one cold maceration. Uh, skins on the juice add color so adding more time on the skins directly has given us high confidence in, in increasing that color. Uh, the second one has to do with increasing the time during fermentation uh, through yeast selection. Some yeasts are more aggressive than others. Some are slower uh, acting. Uh, so uh, picking that yeast may affect that time in fermentation. And the third one uh, has to do with the temperature of fermentation. And there are, there are mins and max associated with temperature uh, so it's important to understand those, but the higher end of the range is a higher temperature and that may accelerate the chemical reactions, shortening the, uh, uh, the uh, length of uh, fermentation time and reducing the time on skins. So we have th we've got to the point where we have these three options. Uh, you and the team decide what attributes are important to you. And this one, quality, we're just going we're saying is, is color, but uh, these different options have different schedule and cost implications. And so uh, we're all also concerned about how much of time does it take to fix something or how much time does it take to, or cost to implement uh, the same thing, or is there a risk involved? Are we gonna go through these, we're gonna make a decision, pick an option and go execute it next time and it turns out to be uh, very risky and doesn't actually achieve the result we want. So we've included risk here. And so um, we've decided on our attributes, quality, schedule, cost, and risk, which were kind of four major for uh, big business decisions and uh, commercial decisions. Uh, and then we assign weights and weights are done. And we talk more about this in the book. How do, how do you come up with different weights? But they're assigned in your own personal values of what uh, you consider important to resolve uh, for this particular problem. Uh, and you assign those weights. We've got four categories, so they all should add up to 100%. And then you score um, um, these options in accordance with their likelihood of achieving that, that attribute. Some uh, uh, risk is, is kind of the odd one here. So a higher risk of uh, failure gets a lower score because when we add up all of these weighted scores, which means weight times the score is the weighted score and then add them up for the, the four attributes, the highest score is the, in theory, the best decision for picking uh, which of these options. And this is all done it has the power of doing it in a way that you and your team believe is appropriate for 
uh, solving this problem. Okay, so um, in summary, uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, early on, certainly when you're facing your problem, define uh, the quality uh, attributes uh, and proxies that you want to tackle so that you don't spend a lot of resources solving the wrong problem and we're recommend, strongly recommending you, you define those quality goals uh, when you embark on early on in the development of your product. Uh, the cause and effect diagram and analysis uh, allows us to rationally break out uh, the various uh, possibilities uh, during our investigation and visualize the uh, connective threads uh, that uh, potential causes uh, for our particular problem. And uh, the five whys method, and as Joyce mentioned, uh, it's, it's not the five, it's asking it's more asking the probing uh, questions early on so that you can get to deeper layers quicker uh, to uh, get a better shot at uh, understanding the, the root cause early. And then the, the Bow Wow method allows us to narrow the universe uh, when we're faced uh, with a, a plethora of possibilities and look at just the best of the best um, the worst of the worst and look at the contrast in the, the different uh, materials and ingredients that went into that product. And the KTA method is a rational method that allows us to efficiently uh, decide on, on an option to uh, proceed. Uh, and it is, it is something that uh, is important, particularly in the wine, uh, you know, it takes a season to grow the grapes. Uh, it takes uh, many uh, weeks, if not month or so, for maceration and fermentation, and then uh, a year or two of uh, aging before you get to the finished product. So you want to uh, make your decisions uh, carefully before you invest your precious time and resources on, on which option. And the last one uh, we, we've added, uh, even though this talk is about methods to, to help solve problems, uh, but we we prefer not for the problems to start in the first place by implementing preventive measures uh, and getting smarter uh, each year with those. Thank so we'll raise a glass virtually, and uh, we can answer any questions you might have. I'll get out of share so we can see each other better. So I have a question, should I ask? <laughs> How do you wanna go, Keith? Yeah, I think go ahead. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to turn your video on and just go ahead and ask, or you can type in the chat, works too. Whichever you prefer. Talk. All right, I'd say go ahead. Oh, okay. All right, so um, what if you have these, you know, when you say quality, uh, there are these uh, tasting experts who give scores like, you know, wine spectator, wine advocate and all that. Where do you put that in the, uh, quality improvement uh, parts. Okay, um, uh, very good question. Uh, because you know, as we started off, quality means different things to different people, and, and in fact, we have a we have a, a whole chapter on kind of uh, breaking that down and giving people ideas where to look for that. So uh, we um, we do in uh, appreciate. Uh, uh, what we consider expert feedback from uh, uh, wine tasters. Third parties. Third They're parties. They're unbiased, right? And so we, we uh, enter our wines in, in many uh, competitions that have blind tastings. And it's not so much, we had the kind of humorous example at the beginning of getting gold versus bronze, but one of the things that we appreciate from getting expert feedback uh, is that they is the written comments and the the evaluations behind the the scores and many of them use uh, use the, the the 20 point scoring system and we look at over the years we've collected um, a lot of feedback and we've looked at that and taken to heart and used that expert feedback 
to sort of tune the best we can our processes to achieve that. And some of that tuning, uh, you know, is a little bit of a trial and error, but you can kind of figure out from your own historical experiences how to better achieve that. And over the years, um, uh, one of the things, uh, so we start, uh, just a brief story, we started, we started making wine, uh, the first, first batch was okay, second batch maybe a little better, third batch was really very nice. And then the fourth and fifth uh, and, and sixth batch or vintages were not that good. And so we got, now wait a second. So we, in one sense, we sort of lucked out or had that right combination of variables that we weren't actually uh, controlling, but turned out to make the higher quality by virtue of the, the expert feedback. And so that was part of the trigger of why we, we kind of, our book is kind of the quest for quality every time. We want to make sure that we're proceeding on that path to get the continuous improvement. So for us, um, we, we, we like to, we're trying to get, we have our own tastes, personal taste and uh, and after a while you can get tuned in with what other uh, experts taste and is it like ours but we like to get the expert feedback on and we taste a lot of other wines within moderation of course uh, to compare uh, but uh, that's uh, that's what we're trying for and the, the other thing from a consumer standpoint um, if you you have to kind of align what you like to these different experts so if a certain person scores a hundred but it's a wine you don't you don't like then you might not follow that person's scoring um, and where others you might find that you're well aligned you seem to like everything that they like and their high scores so it helps you buy once you get to know who you align with and what those points are on the label at the store <laughs> Next question. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Very good. Ah. So, thank you, Joyce and uh, your name was Bruce. Bruce. Joyce and Bruce. Thank you for your presentation. It, it was uh, great to hear that there is engineering in that kind of industry. So. I am from Chile, and in Chile we have a lot of good wines. And I, I visit with with my wife a lot of wineries, and and they always show you the 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 process, like a magical process. And the winemaker is a kind of uh, wise man or magician that 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 they make uh, the wine with all that knowledge but they don't say nothing about the technique or the chemistry or the physics of the of making wine. So, so my question is, how far are you using that engineering techniques from the mean of the other wineries? They are, they are so far, they don't use anything. They're, they're use just magic <laughs> or, or they also use some techniques and you, you you use or you are so far or, so, or not that not no so far from them. Well, we we certainly um, appreciate California winemakers and the history here because um, for so long it has been a generational art that is handed down through families and um, in California they try to engineer and understand the science behind. Um, winemaking and and test all the variables and really understand the science part and less on the art and uh, that's right up our alley because we like the numbers and we want to understand uh, so we do take more of a scientific approach and then we have to remind ourselves okay but how does this wine make me feel <laughs> we don't have much feelings no, I'm kidding uh, but it is um, a lot of winemakers don't want to give away their secrets either. So they're talking in broad terms because if they make a unique wine, that's, that's their selling point. 
And if they tell you what kind of yeast they use or, or native yeast, or they tell you their secrets, they're afraid they're going to lose their business. So it's, it's some of that too, but, but we definitely take a more scientific approach to the whole hobby. And, and also to, to add to Joy, some of Joyce's comments, uh, uh, we, we have talked to other uh, many different winemakers over, over the years, and uh, we actually haven't talked to Chilean winemakers, but some in New Zealand and Australia and uh, other countries, and uh, as well as California and uh, in Washington and Oregon, uh, and, and appreciate that they're, you know, the um, kind of the clinical scientific engineering approach isn't the only approach to, to arrive at, at a nice qual uh, quality end item product. You can have uh, generations uh, uh, and um, centuries of working on working with a vineyard and working with processes to develop uh, a very nice wine and have tremendous uh, respect for those winemakers and uh, in families and uh, and the quality products that they make and so uh, there's there's many different different ways and we're kind of approaching it from from where we came from. So. Thank you. Hey, um, I have a question. So, um, and you guys addressed this a bit too, saying how, you know, the, the, the process time is so long from growing the grapes to crush and, you know, aging and bottling. Um, and there are so many variables. How are you guys controlling enough of the variables to actually isolate where these causes are actually coming from? Like, I, I can imagine that there are so many variables that go into the final bottle. Like, do you narrow it down to like per barrel or per vintage of a, of a variety? Yeah, depending on the problem, sometimes that's what helps you that, to isolate where your problem is, is to look at what are those differences. Certainly when we do some experiments, we try not to have too many variables. We try to, okay, let's keep this all, all these factors the same and let's only change this and see what happens. Trials are often done in winemaking where you get small samples, you try different things and see, okay, I've, I've used six different yeasts and I get the best flavors out of this one. So next year I'm going to use that one or the combination of two. So in any given like um, vintage of a variety, like how many experiments do you have running at a, a given time? Well, this year. Yeah, yeah. so that, it's, that's a great question because uh, it's one of the things that's fortunate for us is that we don't have a commercial boss, so we can run experiments. And <laughs> essentially our, our whole process is kind of out of the mainstream production line. Uh, but this year, um, in the, we're trying a um, deficit irrigation controlled experiment in the vineyard. And as you know, deficit irrigation is a common practice in, in, in many vineyards because there's that right amount of of water that uh, doesn't uh, dilute the concentration of flavor compounds and such. And so um, we're, we are a little worried that we maybe have too many experiments going on in our vineyard because it, uh, this year is also, we have the difficult, uh, you know, social distancing, shelter in place, COVID issues. And so it's Joyce and I that are running the vineyard experiment. And uh, essentially we have different uh, blocks in the, in the vineyard. Uh, we have, and we have uh, four different uh, irrigation levels and we've been working to actually adjust those levels uh, as a fraction of uh, evapotranspiration so that we can uh, quantify how much we're watering, how does the grape ripen, uh, what's its chemistry, and then follow that through the finished wine. And we, we, one of the things we didn't mention about 
with the, with the measurements are good because you can track trends, but you can compare against standards. Uh, in our experiment, we're also have, uh, we're gonna be comparing against published standards. UC Davis has done a bunch of these experiments in their experimental vineyard. And we're comparing it, our own uphill and downhill, which are one is at a, at a quarter of uh, ET and the other is a, a half. And we have the same varieties. And so we're going to try to, it will take us uh, probably uh, one, two, or three years to sort it out. But you're going to the point to, to really isolate when you get down to the, root cause, to the root cause, you really have to isolate all those variables. And so uh, that's part of our deficit irrigation experiment. Yeah. Is watering more better or, or not as good? Can we save money watering? And do we like, or can we even tell the difference in taste? Um, so trying to do those things. It's, what's hard though is the smaller, the more samples you have, then you can't, you don't have enough wine to fill barrels. You've got small containers. Um, and we already have like six different grape varietals, so we keep those separate through picking, fermentation, etc. We don't do any blending till later. So it gets a little tricky. So you, you've got to not, uh, unless you just are an experimental lab, you, you have to choose each year what might we want to um, try to compare. I, I think we're throwing in a little extra experiment this year, yeah. though, on... Um, yeah on yeast, but we're going to do it within the watering thing. Okay, so the cab in this watering condition versus the other watering condition, we're going to do it with the same yeast and we're going to try different yeast on the two more lows and things like that. So we don't lose track of what, what the experiment is trying to show us. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think if there are no more questions, we have maybe time for one more. It's two minutes left. Are there any other quick questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Bruce and Joyce, for uh, presenting today. Um, we will go ahead and uh, record, uh, put this uh, recording, um, share it with the group here, and put it on YouTube. And please let me know if you have any questions for Bruce and Joyce, and I can connect you. Um, and thank you all for being here and having um, great questions to, to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, see y'all. Thank you.